Now, you see, when your, ex your identity is defined by society, you cannot resist it. You don't have the knowledge, you don't have the wisdom, you don't have the resources to understand that something's being put over on you. You cannot but help believe the definition of you as a free agent. But you believe yourself to be a free agent as a result of not being free. That is to say, of being uh, uh, hopelessly unable to resist society's identification of you. So, in, in the whole sense of our personality, there is a contradiction. And that is why the sense of ego, of being oneself, is simultaneously a sense of frustration. The feeling of I-ness, so far as most people are concerned, is a feeling of tension between the eyes and behind them. Uh, Trigant Barrow, a remarkable man, did some studies about uh, two kinds of awareness, which he called ditension and cotension. In di ditentive is the normal kind of awareness that we have of being a skin-encapsulated ego, of being separate from the environment, and of confronting an external objective world of which we are the independent observer. And this myth, he said, uh, goes hand in hand with a physical state, which is a state of tension between the eyes. Then he defined cotension as another form of awareness, which you might call a certain kind of openness, in which you realize that the external world is just as much you as anything inside your skin. And that you are not something that comes into this world on probation and doesn't really belong. This is, you see, the attitude that we foster in the child. But that you are something not that comes into the world, but comes out of it. In the same way as a flower comes out of a plant or a fruit comes out of a tree. That you are an expression. You, as a human being, are a symptom of nature and that you really belong there, and that, uh, furthermore, your actual self, what is finally and fundamentally you, is not a separate and lonely part of the world, but the real you is the world itself, everything that there is, expressing itself as this particular organism here and now, and, of course, as you look across the room, as all these other organisms in there, here and now, we are all tits on the same sow, if I may put it so crudely. Or if you want to put it more poetically, <laughs> rays from the same sun. <laughs> now? <laughs> now? Children very often ask their parents, you see, as a result of having been given this funny sense of identity, Mommy, who would I have been if my father had been someone else? This is a very common child's question. Because the child gets the message from the parents using the English language, the French language, the German language, or whatever, that I am somewhat in my body, you gave me my body, but who am I to whom this was given, you see? You can say to a girl in our culture, darling, you're absolutely gorgeous, you're so beautiful. And she says, how like a man, all you think about is bodies. I may be beautiful, but that's my parents gave me my body. But I want to be admired for myself and not for my chassis. And this poor girl is a chauffeur. She's alienated from her body. And she doesn't uh, take any credit, doesn't assume any responsibility for being what she is physically, and this is, of course, as much true of men as of women. It is a common cultural attitude. We say, I have a body. We don't say, I am a body. We feel a very sharp distinction, in other words, between our consciousness which is a kind of focused attention together with all those actions that we are able to perform voluntarily on the one hand and on the other hand everything both within us and outside us that seems merely to happen to us 
Consider for a moment breathing. Do you breathe or are you breathed? You can feel it either way. If you become conscious of breathing, you get the sense that you are doing it in the same way as thinking or walking. But if you forget about it, it goes on. And you don't have to do it at all. That is why breathing exercises are fundamental in all meditation practices in the Orient. Because you can understand through breathing and through the experience of breathing that there really is no differentiation between the involuntary experience and the voluntary experience. But when you make set up game rules whereby you identify all that you do voluntarily with you and all that happens involuntarily with the other, with what happens to you, and then you put a gulf between these things, not realizing, and this is the secret that is never given away, that self and other are inseparable. Just in the same way that the front and the back of a coin are different but identical. There's all one coin. So in exactly the same way, the experience of self and the experience of other are mutually necessary. You wouldn't know what you meant by self unless you knew other. You wouldn't know other unless you knew what you meant by self. They are therefore polarities, like north and south pole of a magnet. They're inseparable. But that secret doesn't get out because uh, civilized language and thought ignores the fact that all classes, all logical classes, and words are after all labels on classes, are so constructed that they are intellectual boxes and every box which has an inside also must have an outside. And we think that insides exist apart from outsides and outsides apart from insides. We don't realize that although they are opposed, they go together. And you see, that is the secret of the whole thing. That is what the child is not let on to. And so instead, the child is defined as a stranger in the earth and not as a symptom of the earth. And as a result of that, we have the vast, terrifying social problem of alienation, our feeling that uh, the world outside human skins is unfeeling, fully automatic stupidity, which we have to fight and dominate. Otherwise, it will swallow us up and condemn us to the imaginary terrors of everlasting nothingness. Now, I feel in a way that when we say I wasn't responsible for being born. You know, in the, one of the great problems of psychotherapy today is passing the buck. Uh, by a kind of superficial Freudian attitude, you as a juvenile delinquent are not responsible for what you do because it was your parents who fouled you up. And so they write articles in the press that instead of prosecuting the children, we ought to prosecute the parents. So they haul the parents in, but the parents say, I know we're mixed up, but that was the fault of our parents. <laughs> and it all goes back to a, a guy called Adam, and he blamed it on Eve, and she blamed it on the serpent. And God said about the serpent, um, mm -mm -mm, I'm not responsible for the serpent. He did it on his own, you see, because... The serpent is the left hand of God. And what we call God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, etc., that's the right hand. But Jesus Christ sits on the right hand of the Father. Nobody ever says who sits on the left. Because let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. See? My temper got the better of me. I didn't really mean it. My uh, lusts got the better of me. I'm really not responsible for them. They were given to me. You see? Now, all this idea that you, you see, we, we were laboring under a definition of the self, which is extremely limited, so that we, for example, acknowledge thinking and walking and we're doing things with our hands and speaking, but we don't acknowledge that we are growing our hair and beating our hearts. 
That is defined as happening to us. Birth is defined as something that happened to us. And we feel that was my father's responsibility. He had a dirty gleam in his eye and uh, went after my mother and so on, and he did it. Excuse me, the last one to wrap you on taking that up. Yes, all right. Because uh, there, there is this point about uh, responsibility. And one way of looking at it is that uh, we are really not responsible for what happened to our past. We are responsible for what happened to the uh, beginning right now. Yes. But we're not responsible for what happened to us before. No, but you see, I feel this is a, this is a hoax. You see, look, let's suppose now that uh, we will follow the theory of those astronomers who maintain that uh, the universe is not a steady state thing, but there was an enormous bang billions of years ago, and from this bang all the galaxies were thrown out into space. Now, then uh, you look back at this as something which happened in the past and which is, as it were, the cause of the present. But what I would say is that bang is still going on. When you take a lovely bottle of black ink and throw it as hard as you can at a white wall and smash it, all it goes whoosh like this, you know. And in the center it's dense, but on the out fringes it has all kinds of interesting curlicues. And that's all, you see, one splash. Now in the same way, we are at the moment sitting in this room and talking, and thinking, we are all the little curlicues out on the end of the original cosmic bang. We are it. We are not effects of it. Because uh, th to think that you are separate from the Big Bang is simply a matter of definition. It's a way of talking. We separate events from each other in order to measure them. That is to say, the notion that there are distinct things and distinct events in the physical world is a calculus. It is like pretending that a curve is a series of points. And so, in the same way, supposing you have a wiggle. Now, you've got a wiggly line, you see, and the whole world is wiggly lines. Clouds, mountains, people, rivers, everything is wiggly lines. Now, how much of a wiggly line is a wiggle? You see, what is one wiggle? And you can see that this is a very arbitrary matter. So we see the, the more obvious wiggles in the world, and we define them as people. Each of you is a wiggle. And this wiggle is, uh, is you. I'd like to talk yeah. you about one wiggle. What about the wiggle of the child fighting to get out of the uterus through the birth canal yeah. and be born? Yeah. How do you view that? in the general... Well, that's a, simply a repetition of the original explosion. Is he, is he a participant right then and there? Of course. Or a of course. Do you view this... This is a natural expression of the entire Earth... Uh, yes, exactly. This is the, a repetition of the original explosion. Go, man. You see? And... Uh, so then responsibility would start with... It starts with... Yeah, sure, really. It starts before birth, because the definition of yourself as beginning only, when shall we put it? Where did you begin when? At parturition? At conception? Or when you were an evil gleam in your father's eye? When did you begin? Let's go back. You began on the first dawn of creation, whenever that was. That, because you did it. See, everybody's pretending they didn't. And you can kind of play a game. This is what gurus do, you see, Zen masters and so on. They give you a funny look, and you say, well, I have a problem. Please, teacher, I'm this little me, and I'm caught in this thing called life. I got mixed up with all these tubes and nerves, and uh, it's uncomfortable, and I don't know what to do about it, because it's all going to fall apart. And so the teacher says, like, whether it's Sri Ramana Maharshi, or whether it's a Zen teacher, who is mixed up in this thing? Who are you? Who asked this question? Show me. Find yourself. You say, well, <clears throat> it's just me. And he says, oh, come on. You? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. See, so eventually the person feels very bugged because the, the, the teacher is calling his bluff. And you 
are not the Lord God in the Jehovah sense of Christianity, who is the cosmic technocrat, who knows all the answers to everything, but you are the Lord God in the Hindu sense, who is different, because the Hindu God doesn't know how he does everything in the sense that he doesn't translate it into words. He can't explain it, because there's no point in explaining it. You open and close your hand without knowing how you do it, and yet you surely do it. But you can't put it into words how it happens, unless you're a physiologist. And then even so, it doesn't help you much to open and close your hand better than anybody else. See? So you do know how to do it, but you can't explain it. Because the thing, words are a very clumsy way of talking about something which from the standpoint of words and the standpoint of logic is a very, very complicated process. So the, if you ask Shiva how he dances the cosmos, he would say, I just do it. Like you say, well, I just open and close my hand. So the guru says to you, listen, Shiva, don't kid me, you know, that you're not Shiva. Uh, but you're just this thing called Mary Smith or John Doe, etc. Ha ha. <laughs> and everybody says, uh oh, you can't admit that because, you see, if I did admit that, I would have to be considered responsible and I would be considered crazy. And I would feel that I really was one with this whole scheme of things. And uh, that's, you see, the secret that we don't let the children know. In all, well, not in all, but in many cultures, initiation into manhood consists precisely in finding that out. They finally get around to saying to you, after all, you know, we've been pretending all this time that you were just this little boy or little girl, but now we're going to let you in on the real story. But not in this culture. That's the problem. In this culture, we do have an initiation into adult life called psychoanalysis. And uh, uh, everybody is, is ruined by education. And then, uh, this can't be helped because they have to know all the conventions. And uh, just like you, to preserve beef, you make it salt. And when you're going to cook it, you have to soak the salt out of it. So in the same way, to make a child a tolerable companion, you have to... Uh, Yeah, it's going still. Um, you have to uh, be salted with education. Then when that mixes up all your natural instincts, you have to be psychoanalyzed in order to be straightened out and uh, recured of your education, cured of your upbringing. But the difficulty is, you see, that the assumptions of psychoanalysis and of a good deal of psychotherapy in various types and schools do not include the insight that you are basically the works. Uh, they have, in other words, that, that simply because, historically speaking, psychotherapy originated in the 19th century and therefore still carries on the 19th century assumptions about the nature of the universe. And all those 19th century assumptions about the universe were a put-down. They included the myth, you see, that the universe is actually blind energy. It is essentially stupid. And uh, man's intelligence and man's values and man's consciousness are a fluke in the world. And so this myth is that the world the man, in other words, is not a symptom of the world like an apple tree is a symptom an apple is a symptom of an apple tree. But man is a, a fluke, a kind of a joke, a chance. And that to be realistic and hard-headed and uh, factual, in other words, a, a, a strong man, you must realize that you are caught in this trap and face the facts. So then, <coughs> this, <coughs> for the West at any rate, this 19th century philosophy of man's place in the world and his identity has become the most plausible common sense. In other words, people say they are Christians, they say they are Jews, they say they are theosophists, Vedantists, Buddhists, etc., etc., but they are not. 
because they know in their heart of hearts whatever they choose to believe that the world is as described in the 19th century myth because that's become our common sense. If people were Christians, they'd be screaming in the streets. They're not screaming in the streets. They'd be taking full-page ads. They'd be sponsoring TV programs about the tremendous urgency of this Christian bit. And uh, they're not doing anything of the kind. A few Jehovah's Witnesses are doing it, but they are, even they are fairly polite when they come to your front door. They show no urgency, really. So they don't believe it, because the plausible myth of our age is the myth of the fully automatic model of the universe in which man is a fluke and which he doesn't really belong. He is a chance operation and when you're dead, you're dead. And that's all there is to it. And that's so plausible that really almost everyone believes in it without realizing that it is uh, made out of whole cloth. It's a, nothing but a myth. It's a way of looking at things, a way of striking an attitude. But this is the powerful, powerful idea that governs our children and that gives us our sense of basic identity, alienation, so that we live always in expectation of a future, which of course never happens. Well, it's enough for me from the moment.